Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren. It's just good to have all of you back along with us here with this uh, Sunday evening Word Awakening uh, sermon. And uh, to continue to remember one another, my uh, mother-in-law, uh, Jenny Tyler, been having back surgery uh, Tuesday. And uh, my brother-in-law, Billy Fears, up in South Carolina, who just had an eye surgery. Uh, continue to pray for him and my ear as well. My ear's taking a little bit of a setback, like the uh, left ear that I have is really clogged. So just pray that it would be better. It's, uh, you know, not so bad that I can't preach, so uh, we're gonna still going to be faithful, like Paul told Timothy, be in and out of season, so we're still going to do that, and so you just pray for us here, pray for all these things, remember one another in prayer, that God should continue to be with us, thank God for confirming some things in my heart, and pray that he has answered for us uh, today and this past week, and just uh, pray that we'd all just continue to go forward for the cause of Christ, and Christ, the Lord, would continue to meet our needs, amen. Lord, we sure do love you this evening. Thank you for the innocence of sin. Thank you so much for the opportunity to stand and to preach the word of God. Thank you for saving us, for calling us according to your purpose. And I pray you just continue to be with all of us, Lord God. Continue to bless our ministry here and for us as we move up to northern New York. Lord, just give us souls for our labor. Just help us in all things, Lord. Use us in all things as our prayer. Just continue to lead God and direct paths to go. Thank you so much for our dear listeners. Bless them, Lord, I pray. Just give us all that which we need. Lord God, just help us stay fired up for you, doing that work that you have us do, Lord God. And uh, be with all these that uh, stand in need. These are physical ailments. These are spiritual needs, emotional needs, whatever it might be, and my mother-in-law, Lord God, my brother-in-law in my ear, that you just uh, be with these needs, Lord God, just touch us physically, and uh, just help our hearts and souls, Lord, is our prayer, just revive us, Lord, is our prayer, for it's in Christ's name we pray, amen, and amen, so I pray that the Lord will be with us here this evening as well in this uh, sermon, and of course, by way of announcements, going back to, uh, you know, going back to our regular schedule this upcoming week, Tuesday, continue Old Testament survey, Thursday, uh, the Minor Prophets class in the book of Joel, and Friday we will resume the uh, study that we were doing in the book of Job, and I uh, still a good well, let's see, well, actually we're already almost to the July, at the end, end of July, but the Lord has laid it on our heart once again to do another revival. I know we just had one, and this isn't going to be very, very soon, but probably looking at the last week of September, we're going to do another Word Awakening revival. You know, that's just something the Lord just laid on our heart to do, not something I was looking to do. You know, I don't do those things just, you know, for my name so that I can, you know, do all this preaching. But, you know, the Lord laid that on our heart. You know, and there are a lot of people now uh, that are, uh, that are, uh, that are uh, listening to a lot of online preaching because of things going on in the uh, going on in the country and around the world. And, you know, we do have a lot of listeners, I know as well, that live in uh, like other parts of the United States and other parts of the world that don't have a Bible preaching church. And so, you know, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they listen to our broadcast and, you know, that's wonderful. And, uh, you know, so we get, you know, we've gotten good feedback through what we've been doing. And so we thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for all our listeners. So, you know, just continue to pray for us as we seek the Lord's will. Exactly. Of course, like with COVID-19, you know, we wanted to move to upstate New York this fall. But, you know, we may have to wait until the springtime with COVID-19 because New York is one of the is one of the most closed states, even though we're going way up north, way up north in our Franklin County up next to the Canadian border in, uh, in New York, but, uh, but even up there, though, even though that's a very rural area, they still have a lot of things closed up there, like anybody who comes from the state of Alabama who goes into New York has to be quarantined for two weeks, so, you know, that makes it very, very difficult for us, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to go up there and look at houses and things, so, uh, so just continue to pray for us, you know, in all these aspects of our ministry, you know, we know the Lord's in control, you know, and we'll move whenever the Lord would have us to move. And so I just continue to pray. We seek the will of God and all of these things, of course, as well. And also we're going uh, going street preaching again this uh, this coming week, probably probably Tuesday. Uh, probably Tuesday we'll be going in in downtown Warrior. So just uh, pray for us in that regard. Got a lot of great uh, feedback with that so far. The first few times we went, we've had nobody to cuss us out. We've had nobody be ugly to us. Uh, everybody's been receptive. Like I said, the last time we went out one day uh, last week, we actually had a lady who gave us, who owns a local business there in Warrior, who actually came out and gave us a love offering uh, for what we were doing. So, you know, that was uh, who gave us a love offering and invited us to go to her church and, uh, and hope to present our work there. So, you know, that's a great blessing when we have those types of things. And so just continue to pray for us that we'd be faithful and do what the Lord would have us to do. Amen. So now going back to the book of Psalm, chapter number 14. 
uh, Psalm 15, I'm sorry, I believe I said 14. Psalm 15, when we were about 14 last week. In Psalm 15, we'll read the first couple of verses. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And continuing this message out of Psalm 15, dwelling in the holy hill. Our Father, we love you, pray you, I bless you to the reading of your word. Help us as we try to preach. Thank you so much for your grace and mercy, for the confirmation that you put in us, for your many blessings. Just continue to use us and help us and lean down directly and have us to go, Father. Just give us that which we need, Lord. For it's in Christ's blessing, and we pray. Help hearts and souls, we pray this evening. Amen. And amen. And so our first point that we uh, looked at here was uh, who shall sojourn in the tabernacle, talking about living for the Lord and uh, and being a part of the church. And uh, talking about being an established Christian, like being a part of the church and living for the Lord. Uh, that's been the theme here of uh, the theme here of this psalm. So, uh, point number one, who shall who shall sojourn in the tabernacle in verse number one and verse number two, who shall speak and live the truth? which is where we left off there. We looked at uh, letter A there, walk uprightly. Uh, letter B, work righteousness. Like it says there, uh, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. And that's letter C, speak the truth. So we have an individual here who wants to live for God, who wants to be a part of the church, you know, a model church member. That's somebody who's going to walk uprightly. Somebody who's going to work righteousness and somebody that's going to preach the truth. Live the truth, amen. And of course, the word of God is the truth. But even, even from a practical, even from a practical point of view, you know, with honesty. You know, like the, uh, you know, the Lord has no place for an individual who is dishonest. You know, dishonesty is, uh, is you know, it's simply wrong. It's wicked. That's something God hates is a lying tongue. You know, like uh, uh, like like one thing that I hate to see that I can't tolerate is a is a preacher that is dishonest. You know, that should go for anybody. You know, but especially a preacher, a man of God, a, an individual that's supposed to set the example. You know, like I've saw that a couple of times with preachers who were dishonest, a couple of pastors who were dishonest. And you want to know something? Uh, that their churches were very worldly. The spirit of God just wasn't in their church. The church was dead. You know, there were some people in that church that said, you know, amen, raised their hands, hallelujah and all. But, you know, the spirit of God just really wasn't in that church. And that's what's going to happen when somebody is dishonest, especially a pastor who is dishonest. Because the person that loves God, you know, they're going to love the truth. They're going to live the truth. Yes, of course, you know, from a spiritual context, you know, we love the Bible. You know, that's the name of, of this ministry is Word Awakening. You know, I love, you know, I love the Word of God. You know, that's, you know, a big part of what my ministry is. That's you know, really the, you know, the twofold part of my ministry, you know, as a whole, you know, of, you know, of what I do, you know, is, you know, church planning and the word of God, you know, church planning, you know, and teaching the Bible, you know, and writing commentaries, you know, writing books and things, but even in a practical concept, you know, a person who loves God, who's walking close to God, you know, that that's somebody who loves the truth and hate lies, you know, that's somebody who's not going to be dishonest. You know, like John Wesley said before, he said, I wouldn't tell a lie to save the whole world. You know, lying, you know, has no place in the life of a Christian. You know, especially a preacher, somebody that loves God on fire for God. That's a person that's going to be honest about things. You know, a person that isn't going to, you know, a person that isn't going to stand for dishonesty and certainly not going to, you know, stand for lies, telling lies and things. But speak the truth. And yes, you know, the word of God is our truth. You know, that is what we're after. Like John 8, 32, Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. See, a lie will keep you in bondage. See, from a, from a spiritual standpoint, you know, like, you know, religions that lie, you know, that say that say that they're the right way, that they're the truth. You know what? You know, organized religion or unorganized religion, you know, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, Roman Catholicism, you know, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, Islam, Zoroastrianism, and all that. You know, it's all lies. And people who do that are in bondage. You know, people who do that are in bondage. But the truth, the truth will set you free. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. See, you want to be sanctified. 
you know, you've got to have the Word of God. See, that the Word of God ties in these preceding points about walking uprightly and working righteousness. You know, if you want to be a moral person, you want to have righteousness in your life, you've got to have the Word of God. You've got to spend time in the Word of God. See, the more and more you, you know, it's just like anything else. You know, the more and more you make of God, the more and more that, you know, the more spirituality that your life is going to have, the more righteousness your life is going to have, the more of the spirit you're going to have. The more time you spend in God's Word, and the more time that you spend in prayer, walking with the Lord, that's what's going to happen. So speak the truth. And so to speak the truth, we've got to have the truth. And speak the truth in his heart. See, you've got to have the right heart as well. And that is an area that a lot of people, that, that a lot of people miss, you know, even in independent fundamental Baptist churches. You know, that, that's, that's just one thing that I hate to see. That's one thing that, you know, that makes me sick. I'm not trying to sound arrogant or anything. But, you know, I like to see people that have a heart for God that do things for the Lord. You know, not, not unto men. Like Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. See, I like to see people do things with the right heart and with the right spirit. You know, just being honest, like where, like where I'm from, you don't necessarily see, you don't, I don't think you see as much of that now. I say it that way, I don't think, because I don't live in upstate South Carolina anymore. But, you know, like whenever I first surrendered to preach, like in the early, in the early 2000s, you know, still, there were a lot of people up there that simply didn't do stuff with the right heart and the right spirit. You could see, you could get around them, you know, and see how they were. Like a lot of people, you know, who would, you know, who would, you know, raise their hands, shout and everything. You could tell they were just doing it for attention. You know, yes, you know, I like, like you hear me preach. I, I love good standards. You know, a person who consecrates their self to God, you know, I'm all for you. That's what I'm trying to do in my heart and life. But I, I've seen a lot of people preach things like preach morals and things. But they simply, you could tell they didn't do it for the Lord. They did it for attention. You know, they, they just did it for attention. You know, they were, they were the epitome of being a holier than thou. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. See, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You know, is that what we really do? Do we really love God, you know, with all of our heart? Are we really doing these things because we have a love for God? Or, you know, do we have a love for self? You know, are we doing it for attention? Are we doing it to try and impress other people and, you know, just, just to make ourselves look good? Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. See, all that we do, we do it heartily to God, not unto men. You know, we, uh, you know, we have standards, yes. You know, we have standards. We do things for the Lord. You know, we do works for God. But that's just it. It is for God. It's not for our own self. It's not for our own attention. It's not so that we get a pat on the back. It's, it's not so that somebody sees how holy we are and how wonderful we are. You know, a lot of people simply don't have the right heart. You know, they turn it into a show or into a competition. You know, we're not in competition with anybody. We're not trying to show out in front of anybody. You know, just doing what the Lord would have us to do. So have the right heart. Because you also get judged for that. You now it's right there in the Bible. Whatever you do, do it hardly to the Lord. See, that was Pharisees' problems. You know, Pharisees, they didn't do things for the Lord. They did things for their own self, to make their own self look good. And, and to put somebody else down. See, we're getting ready to look at that right here. Like a lot, like a lot of these people, you know, they simply don't do things for the Lord. They do things for themselves, and they also do it to put somebody else down. You know, I'm up here, and this individual is way down here. You know, I'm a lot more holy, a lot more better than this person is. And they just don't have the right heart about things. And now verse number three, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Let her be a good neighbor. 
You know, like in all of this, you know, we've looked at we've looked at walking uprightly, having the right morals, working righteousness, working for the Lord, doing doing good works and and speaking the truth and having the right heart. And then being a good neighbor as well. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, because you know that that simply is an issue. You know, people problems. You know what you know what happens often, you know, why do most why, why do churches split? Usually because of people problems. You know, why do people get into quarrels? Why do things happen? Because of people problems. Because they're not a good neighbor. But see, if you have all of these preceding things, you will be a good neighbor. If you have the right heart, you're speaking the truth. You have morals. You're working righteousness. And as we said there, you have the right heart about things. You're going to be a good neighbor. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. You know, that, that is talking about gossip and all, but that's not just talking about gossip and making stuff up about people. You know, that's all speaking of just letting things go. You know, just because you see, oh, so-and-so over there do something, that doesn't mean you have to go tell the whole neighborhood. You know, that doesn't mean that you have to go tell everybody in the county about it. You know, nor do with evil to his neighbor. You know, certainly not making things up and, you know, just not even spreading anything. You see somebody do something, you know, you simply pray for them and pray that they get it right. You see, a lot of people, they see somebody do something, you know, they just, you know, they probably just go tell everybody else to make that person look bad. When we also know that that isn't scriptural, you know, nor take up a reproach against his neighbor. You know, that's really what that phrase there is taking about, you know, not bringing, not, not bringing up a reproach against somebody, not, not making things up or holding, holding something against somebody for what they did in the past. You know, they let it go, you know, they don't, don't hold a grudge against them, they're not out to get them, you know, not out trying to get revenge against that individual. You know, we pray for them, we're as good as we possibly can be to the neighbors. And we'll look at a little bit more of that even here as well. Let's not continue on here. We've saw number one, who shall sojourn in the tabernacle. Number two, who shall speak and live the truth. And number three here, our last point. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Number three, who shall stand in the Spirit? See, now that we've done these things here, we're speaking and living the truth. You know what we're going to do? We're going to stand in the Spirit of God. You know, we're going to live a life in the Spirit of God. Who shall stand in the Spirit of God? You know, once again, that, that's a model church member. That's a model church member right there. Somebody that is living and standing in the Spirit of God. First all there, verse number four, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. Letter, letter A there, a person uses honest judgment. See, that's a part about being an honest person for the Lord, a person that, that uses honest judgment. Like 1 Corinthians 2.15, I know we did a whole... A whole study about this some time ago. This is a very, very misconstrued topic. But like 1 Corinthians 2.15. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. See, a spiritual person, you know, they judge all things. You know, they judge things biblically. Just like what this verse here, you know, was a big part of that. In whose eyes, this is talking about, you know, that honest person, that good Christian person, or, you know, good believer back in Old Testament times. In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. See, that's a person there that uses honest judgment. See, in his eyes, a vile person is, contem is contemned. You know, a, a wicked person is condemned because they are. You know, it's talking about here, a person who really walks with God, you know, they're not going to praise a wicked person. 
you know, they're not going to praise a wicked person. They're not going to, you know, you know, they're not going to, you know, twist the truth or just make something up, you know, and make a wicked person look really good and say, oh, that, you know, that individual over there, you know, they have some problems with they're a great person. Nah, you know, they know that an evil person is condemned. An evil person is just that, you know, they don't praise an evil person. You know, they separate from that evil person. Yes, they pray for them, and they give them the gospel. But, you know, they are honest. You know, they use honest judgment. You know, they're not going to misconstrue things. You know, a wicked, you know, a wicked person is condemned. You know, just like we said when we did that study. You know, like about biblical judgment. You know, using biblical judgment, you know, like especially as a pastor. You know, a pastor, you know, probably has to, you know, has to use more judgment and discernment, you know, than anybody does. Like there with a wicked person, you know, yes, you know, anybody like me and a brother was talking about a few days ago, you know, anybody, you know, even, you know, a homosexual, you know, a person that uses drugs, alcohol, an individual that is, you know, shacked up, a per no, a person like that, you know, cannot join our church. You know, they can't join and be an official member of our church. You know, they can't hold an office. You know, they can't teach a class or do any special singing. But, you know, yes, they can come and sit in our church pews. You know, they can come to our church and sit in the pews. You know, you know, a, you know, a lost person, a person that lives in sin. You know, like we said back when we did that study, you know, like a wicked person. You know, like a man who's an alcoholic or, or you know, a lady who, you know, who's in the pornography business, something of that nature. You know, they can come and sit in our church pews, but that's a person who can't, you know, join and be a member of our church. If that person wants to join our church... You know, we're not going to misconstrue things and say, oh, this person here, you know, just has some problems, but, you know, we still want to take them in our fellowship. No, you know, that's wrong. That's what that verse there is talking about. You know, a wicked person, you know, is condemned. A wicked person, uh, you know, you know, just simply, you know, it's too much like the devil. You know, it's too worldly living too much like the devil. You know, a wicked person, you know, can come and sit in our church pews, but a wicked person, you can't, can't join our church. You know, they can't hold an office, you know, in our church. You know, that's, you know, that's doing what second, what first Corinthians 2.15 says, you know, in New Testament times. You know, he that is spiritual, you know, judgeth all things. Like it says also in Thessalonians, you know, prove all things. See, a lot of people say, you know, you know, you're not supposed to judge, etc., but that simply isn't biblical. We're actually going to look at the text that says that. You know, I didn't really plan to, but we'll go over it just to clarify things. You know, like it says in Thessalonians, you know, prove all things. You know, we're supposed to test everything by the word of God. You know, like 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 me, you know, well, you know, like, well, I'll just use myself for other people. You know, I'm a church planning missionary. You know, like I have no issue at all, like when I call churches to present our ministry or I drop in on other churches, you know, like I have no problem at all, you know, with pastors who ask me questions, you know, what, what translation of the Bible do you use, you know, what kind of doctrine do you have, you know, that is biblical judgment, you know, they're judging me, that's what they're supposed to do, you know, using biblical judgment. You know, like, what is my doctrine, you know, what is my work ethic, you know, what do I plan to do in the ministry? You know, that's using, you know, that that's being spiritual and using biblical judgment. Because, you know, we're supposed to prove all things. You know, we're supposed to test everything, you know, according to the word of God. You know, in the same scenario, you know, like, you know, like with the church, you know, that I start. Like with people who are interested in being members. You know, those are people, you know, that we're going to examine. You know, we're going to use biblical judgment, you know, and see how really spiritual those people are. You know, were those people, you know, yes, you know, were those people saved? You know, what kind of walk do those people have? You know, did they agree with our doctrine? You know, why, why do they want to be a member of our church? You know, why do they want to be a member, you know, of a strong, you know, fundamental Bible-believing church? You know, Amos 3.3, you know, like we mentioned this morning, said back Saturday, last day of revival. You know, that that's Amos 3.3, you know. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Can two walk together for, you know, a particular purpose? You know, to those people, do they have the same purpose in our life? We certainly hope they do. You know, that's why we're starting the church. You know, we want to see people saved. You know, we want to see people, you know, with a desire, you know, to become a member, you know, of a strong, fundamental Bible-believing church. But, you know, is that why they want to join? You know, like, we'll go there, you know, back to Matthew chapter number 7.
like Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. I know that's where a lot of people land. They say, well, you're not supposed to judge. Well, look at that in its right context. Continuing on, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. See, look at verse number three, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, you know, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? That's talking about hypocritical judgment. You know, like me, I'm, you know, I'm Brother Cooper, you know, just, you know, using a name out there, we'll say Brother, uh, 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 what's a good funny last name to use, brother? Uh, brother Thermos. You know that just came to my mind, brother Thermos. I don't know a brother Thermos. That's why I'm using it. But like, well, let's say me, brother Cooper. You know, I uh, br brother Thermos is also a preacher, and uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm gonna rebuke brother Thermos because instead of studying the Bible and praying more, the only thing he does is sit and watch Lifetime and Hallmark movies. You know, Brother Thermos, you know, you're just wrong. You a preacher. You, you know, you ought to be spending your time praying, studying the Bible, and not doing ministry. And, and all that I see you do is sitting and watching Lifetime and Hallmark movies. You know, just waste your time watching movies. Yet, me, Brother Cooper, I'm also not studying the Bible and praying. I'm playing video games all the time. You know, I've got my Xbox. I really don't. I don't have a video game system. But, you know, let, let's say me, I'm saying, I'm telling after Brother Thermos, rebuking him, because all he does is sit and watch Lifetime and Hallmark movies. But me, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sitting and watching Lifetime and Hallmark movies, but I'm sitting in front of the Xbox and playing the NHL hockey game all day long. You know, from sunup to sundown. You know, I've got it on season mode on NHL hockey. I'm the New York Rangers. I've already won two Stanley Cups trying to win a third. You know, that's all I do with my time. Yet I'm rebuking Brother Thermos for watching movies all day long. I'm not watching movies, but am I studying the Bible and praying, or am I wasting time playing video games? I'm wasting time playing video games. I'm 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 judging him like a hypocrite. You know that's what that verse that's what that text is saying in Matthew seven. That's talking about hypocritical judgment because that's what these people were doing. You know that they were criticizing people for doing things whenever they were also doing it. They might have not have been doing it in the same way, just like me and Brother Thermos. You know, I'm not sitting watching movies all day. I'm not wasting my time watching movies. You know, but I'm sitting in front of I'm sitting in front of the Xbox all day playing video games. You know, I'm just as guilty. I'm wasting time. You know, with a bunch of carnal things. You know, that don't even matter. You know, whenever I ought to be praying and studying the Bible. You know, when I'm rebuking another preacher. You know, you know, for not doing the same thing. And see, and that's what that's talking about. Because if you look at this text in the very same text, Jesus, he actually does judge people. Like you go right down there in Matthew seven, you skip down to you skip down to verse number seventeen. Or well, let's let's start there at uh like let's start at verse number fifteen. There, it says, "Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves." See here, just a few verses later, Jesus is telling people to biblically judge. He is saying, "Beware of false prophets." You know, that's what I was just saying. You know, yes, you know, we want to support missionaries, but, you know, we want to support biblical missionaries. We don't want to support false prophets. You know, we want to support missionaries that believe the King James Bible, that preach the King James Bible, that hold the biblical doctrine. You know, we don't want to support false prophets. You know, that, that's why pastors, you know, why they ask me questions and things. You know, because they want to support biblical missionaries, but they don't want to support false prophets. You know, beware of false prophets. You know, that's why you do those things. You know, like whenever a missionary, you know, inquires, like whenever I, I inquire to churches, you know, to present our ministry or, you know, after we start our church, other missionaries, you know, they inquire, you know, you know, you know, to me, yes, you know, we, we want to support more churches, you know, honored to do that. You know, I like us, you know, that's what I'm doing. I'm producing another church, you know, and I want our church, you know, to, you know, to help produce other churches, you know, all around the world. But, you know, you got to be aware of false prophets because there are a lot of them out there in this day and time, you know, always have been. You know, like we mentioned in our revival, you know, they were prevalent in the Old Testament, you know, in the days of Jose, Amos, and Micah, and, you know, they're, they're still prevalent today. It's why Jesus says this here, you know, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly they are ravening wolves. You know, ye shall know them by their fruits. You know, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? 
you know, even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. You know, just like, you know, like I said, you know, like with examining people with church membership. You know, somebody wants to become a member of a church, you know, you have to examine them. That's what Jesus is saying here. You know, yes, you know, like, you know, me, I'm, you know, I'm a church planner. I mean, if the Lord, you know, if the Lord allows, I'd like to have, you know, 5,000 people, you know, in the church, you know, that we start. But, you know, those, you know, those people, if that's 5,000 or if it's five people, you know, those are people that have to, you know, what, what the text says here, you know, verses 15 to 17. You know, those are people that have to bear good fruit. You know, th those are going to be people like Amos 3.3. 3, those are going to be people who have to have the same purpose that we do. People who are saved, you know, people who have the right heart, like we were mentioning. People that have the right heart, the right desire, you know, to be a member of our church. You know, people that want to be a part of a fundamental Bible-believing church. You know, because, you know, they want to hear the truth. You know, they want to hear the truth preached. You know, they want to be a part of our church because they want to be a servant. You know, they want to be a witness. You know, they, they, want, they want to reach northern New York with us. You know, people who really want to be a part of a church. You know, to be a witness. You know, not people who just want to be a part of a church, you know, for social reasons. You know, not people, you know, who just want us to, you know, like who want us to, you know, to have some type of, you know, recreational hockey game every, you know, Friday and Saturday night. Not that sure that there's something, you know, something wrong with that every once in a while. But, you know, that's not the purpose of a church. A church isn't, you know, for, you know, you know, a church isn't a social hall. You know, a church is about preaching, you know, and being a witness. You know, that's, you know, you know, just being honest, that's a big problem with churches now. You know, their church, you know, churches are more of a social hall than they are a Bible preaching center. You know, that's using biblical judgment. You know, people like, you know, in a church, you know, in a church examine people, you know, who are prospective members. You know, that's people who are saved. That's people who have the right heart, the right desire, you know, to be a part of a church. You know, like I said, I'm, I'd like to do a study like about that sometime, like about regenerate church membership, you know, having a model church. Like what Brother David Clouds wrote a lot about. You know, I recommend all of you listening. You know, go read that. You know, go to whalelife.org and look that up about regenerate church membership. You know, he's wrote a couple of great, he's actually wrote a whole, you know, a number of books about that. But, you know, even articles, you know, articles that are free. You know, you can look that up and read, you know, a, a couple of free articles about that. It's really good, you know, about the type of people, you know, who should be in a church. You know, and same with biblical judgment. You know, he actually wrote a book about that. That's actually a free ebook. You can download it. It's called The Judge Not Heresy. That goes right along with that. It's not continuing on there, verses 18 to 20. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. See, you know, you're going to know, but you, you know, it's really just common sense. You know, like a lot of this judge, you know, judge not crowd that's always screaming that. Yes, there's some things that we are not allowed to judge. And I'd also like to do a study on that, you know, you know, like particular things. But, you know, just using common sense, you know, you know, a lot of this here, you know, which is common sense, you know. You know, like we always say, like somebody, you know, who spends, you know, five minutes a day praying and five minutes in the word of God you know, versus five hours in front of a television, you know, that simply is not a very spiritual person. I mean, I know that, you know, you know, that might not be popular, but that's just the fact of the reality. You know, the fact of the reality is most people living in fundamental Bible living churches, you know, that's how they live, you know, in this day and time. You know, they spend, the, you know, they send, you know, spend five hours in front of the TV or, you know, you know, playing video games or out fishing and doing, you know, hunting, playing golf, whatever recreational activity, you know, and they spend, you know, they might spend five minutes, you know, in prayer, reading the Bible, you know, by most people I know, not even that much. But see, like, wherefore by their fruits, you know, ye shall know them. You know, a lot of that, you know, is a lot of this, you know, really is just, you know, common sense, you know, with biblical judgment. So letter A, a person uses honest judgment. Letter B. That last uh, sentence there, verse number four. He that sweareth to his own hurt 
and changeth not. That there is talking about a person keeping their promises. He that sweareth to his own hurt. This is somebody who keeps a promise even if it's inconvenient for them. Now generally speaking, this is like talking about a, uh, it's talking about some type of financial deal. Like back in, uh, you know, these ancient times with Israel. You know, like, uh, like land and things, kind of like, you know, even in our day and time, like with the, with the, with the uh, law of supply and demand, like if, uh, if a person, you know, promised to, uh, to sell t some type of land to an individual, uh, for, uh, for a price, for a price, you know, say, you know, you know, agreed to do that. And then two months, you know, two months later, you know, whenever they're closing the deal, you know, the, the way the way pro, the way uh, the economy has changed, you know, it could hurt that individual for promising that person that land for what is now a very low price. You know, like let's say that uh, uh that, that uh like I like uh, I started to make a deal with somebody, and I told them that they could have a piece of land for three thousand dollars. And then whenever, you know, we go to close the deal, you know, that piece of land is actually worth more. You know, it's like it's more like worth five thousand dollars and it's gonna be like I'm I'm losing money off of the deal. But see, even though that person there is gonna be hurt by it, see, like it says he that sweareth to his own hurt, you know, even though that might hurt him or inconvenience him, you know, he still does it and changeth not. You know, he still keeps his promise, you know, and sells that piece of land, you know, for just you know, a couple thousand dollars, you know, when he really could have got five thousand dollars out of it, you know, the way the economy had changed. Or if it's something, you know, that does, you know, just inconvenience a person, you know, like you promise, you know, you're going to go help a person do something, but it's raining and it's storming and you really don't want to get out. But yet, you know, you still do it. You know, once again, that's honesty. You see that? You see, that's a big theme here, you know, is honesty. You know, that's just like biblical judgments, you know, not that we want to hurt people, you know, hurting people, that has nothing to do with it, it's about being honest, you know, it's about being honest, you know, and protecting it, it's not about hurting, you know, the lost person, or the wicked person, the person that doesn't live right, but it is also, like, about protecting our congregation, uh, the Lord's kind of just laid on me to clarify that, you know, like, as a pastor, you know, whenever I start, you know, whenever I start a church, you know, like, if you let a worldly person, or a lost person, you know, a person that, you know, just really isn't qualified, you know, to be a member, you know, like of a biblical person, not that we're trying to hurt that person that we deny church membership from, but we also do that, you know, to protect our congregation. You know, just like with our, uh, you know, just like with our, uh, you know, guest preachers, you know, like an evangelist, yes, you know, evangelists, they're biblical you know, I'd love to have a biblical evangelist, you know, a real good evangelist come and, you know, preach a revival at the church, you know, that we start. But, you know, that has to be just that, a biblical evangelist, you know, just like we were reading there in Matthew 7. You know, if that person is a false prophet, you know, what is he going to do? He's just going to hurt my congregation. You know, like with missionaries, you know, even if you have a missionary in, you know, that's not biblically straight and they come into your church and preach, you know, what are they going to do? You know, they're just going to hurt your congregation. You know, it's not that we try to hurt, you know, the person that really isn't qualified to be a church member, but it's not it's not going to do them any good if they join our church. You know, they need to get their heart right, you know, before, you know, before they join our church. And, you know, that that also, you know, that is, that's an inconvenience. That's a heartbreaking thing to do. I'm a person that don't like confrontation. You know, don't listen to me thinking I'm a person, you know, that's just looking for confrontation, you know, looking for, you know, reasons to deny a person, you know, church membership or something of that nature. No, not at all. You know, I hate confrontation. I'd hate to do that. You know, that would greatly inconvenience me, a person with my personality to do that, you know, but it is biblical. You know, even though that might be inconvenient for us, and even though that might be, you know, like a hard pill to swallow, you know, verse 4, the first part, you know, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. You know, we have to be biblical about things. So see letter uh, B here, that's a person who keeps promises in verse number 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Let her see, person doesn't take advantage of people. Like that word there, usury, that's talking like about high interest rate. He that putteth not out his money to usury. You know, like if you let, like if, uh, 
like here back in this day and time, like let's say an Israelite, you know, he sold, he sold a, uh, you know, he sold like a bunch of equipment to another person and he let him finance it. But, you know, he's charging him really high interest rates. You know, that wasn't allowed by law. That was very wrong. You know, that's taking advantage of somebody, you know, charging them a bunch of, a bunch of high interest rates on something. Because that's actually in the law, like in Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, verses 36 and 37. Take thou no usury of him, or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals in, for increase. You know, that's charging a person high interest rate. You know, once again, you know, that also has to do with honesty, you know. Like a, like a really righteous person, you know, they don't take advantage of other people. You know, like financially. You know, he putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. You know, also that's not somebody, you know, that takes, you know, that takes, that takes advantage, you know, of a poor person. You know, often, you know, poor people that really need something, they'll kind of be at your mercy. But, you know, when it comes, you know, to a poor person, you know, you're fair and you try to help that poor person. Like if that poor person, you know, needs something to you, you know, you get, you know, you give them something at a reasonable price, you know, as cheap as you possibly can. You know, to help that person, You're not out to take advantage and make big money off of people, you know, but to try to help people. Like that's what we said this morning. You know, a truly spiritual person, you know, they'll be satisfied with the bare necessities. You know, like all the people throughout the Bible, you know, that the Lord really, really used, like the apostles, you know, and the prophets. You know, that they were people, you know, who didn't, you know, who didn't make a lot of money. They didn't make a big, you know, they, they didn't make a big living. You know, they're people who were just content, satisfied with living on the bare necessities. You know, a truly righteous person, you know, is going to be happy, you know, with that. You know, just living, you know, on the bare necessities because their treasure isn't in this earth. You know, it's not in the things of this earth, you know, but it's in heaven. Lastly, here we'll be through that last phrase. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. See, a person is planted. And righteousness. See, like a person that's planted in righteousness, you know, they're not going to waver. You know, they're going to be a complete person. You know, that's what that term perfect, you know, means in the Bible. It means complete. A person that's spiritually mature. You know, a person that's not going to waver. You know, that's a person that's going to be consistent, you know, in all of these things. You know, they're going to have, you know, the right biblical judgment. You know, they're going to be an honest person. You know, they're going to be consistent about things. Like Second Peter 1.10, Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. See, like, you know, how do you get to that stage, you know, where you're spiritually consistent? Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You know, that's somebody who spends time with God. You know, that's the root of all this. You know, that's somebody who spends time in the Word of God. Somebody who spends time in prayer. You know, somebody who walks with God, who has a desire for spiritual things. Psalm 16, 8. You know, a text we'll probably look at next week. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. See, I have set the Lord always before me. You know, that's something that's always in the word of God, always in prayer. You know, a person that always has fellowship with God, like we said this morning, a, a person that's always seeking the will of God first for their life. You know, that is a truly spiritual person. You know, a truly spiritual person, you know, will not be moved. You know, they will hold their ground, you know, what the Lord wants them to do. You know, and they will be honest. They'll be all these things. You know, that's a person, you know, that, that will be honest, you know, that won't take advantage of people. That's a person that won't gossip. You know, that's a person that won't hold grudges against people for things that they've done in the past. You know, that is a model church member. You know, that's definitely what churches need in this day and time. You know, we're going to have a model church. You know, you got to have model church members. Amen. And so thank you all so much for being with us here this evening. We don't take it lightly that you came and been with us. Hope it's been a help and a blessing to you. I've been helped. That's great scripture there. You know, not because I preach, but, you know, the Word of God is just so amazing. The closer and closer that you get to God, you know, just, just the more and more and more, you know, that you love the Bible. 
So let's do all these things, amen. Let's be consistent in our hearts and lives. Let's walk with God. You know, let's be unchanging. You know, that's what we need, people that are rooted in the Word of God. You know, are people that are going to be unchanging. You know, they're not going to go back and forth with things. So let's do that. Let's be holy and consistent with our walk with God. So be praying for uh, folk this upcoming week, uh, like my mother-in-law is going to have surgery. Of course, like my ears, still got that ringing in it and all. It's clogged up. I just pray, pray that it would get unclogged, that it would get resolved. Let's remember one another in prayer. Remember all these on the bed of affliction. I know there are many out there that I uh, that I don't know of. So let's pray for all these people. Let's pray for each other spiritually. That we would all walk with God and be what we ought to be to build his kingdom. Amen. Be back here Tuesday night. So, you know, only going to have about a day break and I'll be back at it again. And so, amen. So let's pray one for another that God would be with us this upcoming week. Let's be revived. Amen. Let's continue to be revived and grow closer and closer to God. Our Father, we love you. Thank you for this great Lord's Day. Thank you for the opportunity to stand and preach. We don't take it lightly. Just pray you touch and help us. And just lead God in direct, Lord, and wait have us to go. Just keep us safe, Lord God. Uh, just to help all the things that we have, Lord God. Just to help those with utility needs. That you help and bless them. May all our utilities work well and go well. Be with these on the bed of affliction. Like my mother-in-law having served. That should be with her. Be with my ear and my brother-in-law, Brother Billy Fears. And, uh. All the others out there that may be out there, Lord God, those with cancer, those with diseases, those that need help. I pray you touch and help them. Those with spiritual needs, with resentment in their heart, Lord God, that may, they may be holding grudges that need to get close to you. I pray you'd help us all with that. I pray that we just ever be a faithful people, Lord God, doing your work and doing your will, that we stay in the word, that we stay in prayer, that we live it. That we live it, Lord, as our prayer, that our hunger and our thirst would grow for the word of God and the things of God. And that desire would grow and that we would ever be a faithful people, Lord God. That you would revive us as send us another great awakening, Lord. Of course, in Christ's blessed name we do pray. Amen. Man, thank you so much for being with us, folks. We'll see you Tuesday. I love you all. I am Dr.